Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? I heard a huh. How's everyone else doing? This is interesting. We're heavily, this is opposite. Man, it's mirrored. Normally, we've got a lot of people over here, and this side is, is more empty. Cool. The introverts, uh, the extroverts have moved in. <laughs> Ambrose family, you're in trouble. People are going to talk to you. They're going to be friendly, too. Hey, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that uh, we get to worship together. Um, boy, it's good to see you. I have tried to get uh, Bethany to come up on this stage, and she came closer. Elizabeth. Beth. I have tried to get her on stage. She hasn't actually made it up here yet. And that puts me in an odd place because I can't go any farther forward. To, hey, Beth, Hi. how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, good. I'm going to give you a microphone here. Um, everybody, this is my friend Beth, Beth Summick. And Beth is one of our teenagers who is in grade 12. I am in grade 12. And so next year there's exciting stuff happening. And yeah, yeah and that's going to be a good thing. And so Beth contacted me and said that she has a plan. And I said, great, come and tell us about it on Sunday morning. So. So hello, everybody. This is awesome. Yep. Okay, cool. Sundays from now, March 27th, we will be hosting a soup and sandwich uh, fundraiser for the Lighthouse Assisted Living after church. Uh, we would appreciate it if you could all come out, maybe have some donations, that would be nice. <laughs> sell, sell harder. Uh, how good is the soup? I don't know yet, we haven't made it. No, it oh, is. It's good, it's good? Okay. He says okay. It's good. Hold, hold on, we're going to have a chat here. The soup is awesome, and so are the sandwiches. You gotta tell them that. Okay, the soup, awesome. Sandwiches, more so. So soup and sandwiches for a fundraiser for the Lighthouse Assisted Living. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Okay. okay, so they're gonna come here on Sunday. March We're gonna have the 27th. March 27th, which is two Sundays from now. Not next week, the week after. The week after, and we're gonna have a service, and after the service, after the service and, and uh, you're hopeful that people will come and they'll leave uh, some money, and all of this money goes to where? The Lighthouse Assisted Living. Okay. And this is, a, this is an organization that helps people who have not enough to eat, to be clothed, to have a place to live, and uh, other necessities. You know better than I. Yeah, and it's also a place where people come to and they can receive different kinds of help, psychological help, medical help, at least those paths are, are uh, uh, through this place. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, a $20 bill, that's, the, that's sort of the pink one, and it's got 100 written at the top of it. Yay. And that's the, yeah, yeah. And so that's the, that's the hopeful uh, gift. Yeah, okay. So I'm here. I hope you're going to be here. Thank you very much. Round of applause for Beth, everyone. This is a good thing. It's something put on by the youth for us. Please come. Please be part of that. This will also be the start of our eating together like we used to do in potlucks. Who remembers potlucks? I love potlucks. We haven't been able to do them for a long time. So this one is not actually potluck, but we will eat together nonetheless. So come, be prepared to stay, and uh, we'll participate in this way. We've got a few other announcements for you. Uh, the AGM is upcoming. What's the date on that again? Someone call it out. 29th. So that's right after the, the uh, potluck, like a few days after that, or after the soup and sandwich. So come, the annual report is printed out. Uh, anyone can have one. If you're a member, be real sure that you get one. It's out on the uh, uh, gray piano out back. And I want to draw your attention to, uh, within that, and also posted right beside it, is the report from the nominating committee about elders. So we do this each year, and uh, the question is always, who has God chosen uh, to be an elder in the church? The church has many, many elders. Some of them are on the board, and which ones would God have on the board uh, this season. And so uh, two names uh, came up, which we prayed about and, and uh, felt um, very sure. And I went and I spoke with these two individuals, and they prayed and they listened. And uh, so Ted Glass and Eric Friesen have allowed their names to stand. And so uh, we'll have a membership vote at the AGM, which uh, everyone is welcome to come. Members uh, do the voting at that. If you'd like to have your voice heard, you should come talk to me about becoming a member. We'd love to have you. We'd love to talk about that. Uh, but those two names, um, 
uh, they've let their names stand. If you have another name uh, of another member that you would like to be considered, uh, we will not be accepting nominations from the floor at the AGM. You'll have to bring them to either me or to one of the elders uh, in the time, in the 14 days between then and now. Uh, and we will uh, we'll discuss it and, and we'll pray about it and we'll go from there. But by the time the AGM comes, uh, nominations are closed. So does that everyone understand? Any questions about that? All right, that is the AGM. Um, several weeks ago, I introduced you to the idea that we were going to have an intern come here, someone named Serena, and uh, we were excited to do so. Serena has run into some personal problems, and th- she's not going to be available to us. Uh, we are still wide open to her, but she's not able to uh, do this. And so maybe another day, we've talked with her about that, and that's some stuff that uh, she will need to work out. Um, with her own school. So what I'm telling you is we're not going to have an intern. But I also want to introduce you to the idea that we will be having interns, uh, hopefully, and uh, we pray about this and and hope God will provide them for us. We would like to have a lot of interns. We would like to have regular interns uh, from any number of Bible school that that is around us. We've got, there's quite a few in our uh, in reasonable distance from us. And we are open to these schools. And so we're prayerful We're prayerful that God will provide for us. And we are intentional that uh, should God provide for us in that way, we are going to engage. So look forward to me telling you names. Whenever I get told them, I'll bring them to you. And uh, I think we have something to offer. I really do. And I'm excited about that. And I'm excited about whoever these young people are meeting you and getting to serve alongside you and, and uh, learn and teach. And this will be a good thing. The last thing for us is uh, Colleen Gilbert. Uh, If you're part of the prayer chain, you'll know that uh, she has got uh, double pneumonia. Well, double pneumonia came back also with a positive COVID um, result. She's doing pretty well. Last time I talked to her, she was bored out of her tree playing video games on her phone. Uh, But nevertheless, she's in the COVID ward, and so we need to pray for her. So I'll invite you Let's bow our heads now and we will pray for Colleen. Lord God, we lift up the whole Gilbert family to you. Dale and Colleen, uh, they're in the same house, but there's also kids and grandkids and um, lots of people. High high traffic family. And uh, Lord, we celebrate that. I think that's great. And Colleen is sick. And you know Colleen has had uh, medical issues um, and lung issues for a long time. We've prayed many times for healing there. And we come to you again. We ask for healing. Lord, it is part of her testimony that she was miraculously healed. And we think of the ulcer inside of her stomach. And the doctor said, you need to get your affairs in order. And there's a neat story there as she was healed. And that was years ago. And she is well. And that's not something that bothers her anymore. And the doctors called it a miracle. And it sounds like a miracle to me. It sounds like your fingerprints are all over this. That's part of her testimony. So Lord God, we ask for you to do this again and to heal her and return her to us healthy uh, with a new story and a new sparkle in her eye, ready to praise God for what he has done. Praise you for what you have done. We ask for your healing in Colleen and your protection for Dale, Nick and Simric, and all of the grandkids. Lord God, we ask this of you. In your name I pray, amen. I'm going to start with a story. It is a story that I think is very funny. There are others that don't think it's funny, but because of my placement in the story, I think it's hilarious. And it's something that I bring up from time to time. And every time I bring it up, uh, the main character in the story, a guy named Jeff, wishes I wouldn't, which is too bad for him. When I was a teenager, uh, we, had, uh, we were in Bible school, and he had just graduated high school, and he was heading to Bible school. And there was a certain time when the dorms opened up and everyone was invited to move into the dorm. And I got a phone call from Jeff along with some other people saying, hey, would you come over and help me pack these boxes into my new dorm room? Sure. So, as it is with teenagers, we woke up at the crack of noon and uh, made our way over, picked up not a lot of boxes and uh, some suitcases, and we moved Jeff into the dorm where we proceeded to sit around the dorm welcome the new people that came in, meet the new people, just hang out, have a really great time. 
Supper time comes. We all head into the cafeteria. We are again having a great time. Now there's more people and we are meeting these people and it's an exciting thing. And I'm not exactly sure the specifics on what happened right here, but I'm going to tell you the great effect. Someone, I think it was one of Jeff's brothers, walked into the cafeteria and walked up to Jeff and said, Hey Jeff, did you tell mom that you're moving out today? And Jeff looked at whoever said this, no, no, I didn't, I didn't think of that. Now here's the behind the scenes, Here which, here's what you need to know. Jeff's the youngest in the family. This is the transition for this family as far as mom is concerned. This is the transition from the kids are at home to there are no kids at home. They're empty nesters. And mom has thought about what this day will be like since the moment Jeff was born. But in every instance of her imagination, she was there when Jeff moved out. But in what actually happened, she was at work because nobody told her. Now, we had two options as a friendship group. The first was to help and to drive him back to the house. And the second is to make it as bad for him as we possibly could. And like any good friends, we chose the latter. And so, yeah, we drove him back home. But then we started to offer to mom these different offenses. These, like, can you imagine that Jeff would do After all you did for Jeff, you, you, you literally gave birth to him. You fed him. You raised him all of the times in school where there was trouble and you helped him the sleepless nights. That time, do you remember when it was snowing outside and he couldn't get home right away and you worried and you prayed on your knees for him? Do you remember all those times? And Jeff is over here saying, shut up, Peter. Shut up. Shut up. But I I wasn't in the mood to shut up. I was in the mood to keep pushing. And mom feeling that there was people on her side, bit on all of this and, yeah, Jeff, why did you, you, I wanted to be, I just wanted to give you a hug, I love you. And it's like, Jeff, you're mean, why would you do that to your mom? Now, it's been years, but I'm telling you, and I mean this, every time I am together with Jeff and his mom, it's not often, but someone's usually getting married or something like that and they both show up, I make very sure I'm sitting beside mom and I bring it up again. And Jeff really wishes I wouldn't, but it's so funny. And Jeff's a quiet guy, which means I was the one perpetually in trouble and he never was, so I got him, and I got him big. Can you imagine if that happened to you? Raise your hand if you have kids who have moved away from home. We got, uh, we got hands going up all over here. Raise your hand if you have kids who have moved away from home and then they, like, they got engaged really recently or something like that. Oh, we got one over here. Round of applause. Can you imagine if your kid moved out and didn't tell you? Yeah, neither can I. Where's my oldest? Don't do it. I don't want to deal with your mom if you move out and don't tell. If we find out from someone else, it's going to end bad. You'll be moved back in. It's just one of those things. It it was as innocent as can be. He just didn't really think about how it affected his mom. He also has a dad. Dad seemed to think it was funny, but dad's also a quiet guy, so he didn't say much. But it it was just one of those things. He didn't didn't reflect on how that would affect mom. He He didn't think it through. He didn't mean anything malicious by it. He just didn't think about it. And we were there to correct him because we are good people. And we are there to just, (laughs) so he he is now a father. He's got three children. And every time his wife got pregnant, (laughs) everyone was like, did you tell your mom? You should hang up with me right now and you should call your mom right now. When he graduated, did you tell your mom? I mean, anything. If he bought new shoelaces, did you tell your mom? He gets tired of hearing it. We don't get tired of saying it. So Jeff, if you're watching right now, I'm not even close to sorry. You shouldn't have done that. That's just, that's just funny. I told my mom, you should have told yours. Makes me laugh. We're in the book of Hebrews. And we're working through the book of Hebrews. And when we talk about the Hebrew people, when we talk about Jewish people, I sort of feel like a broken record. Uh, But something that is true all through Scripture is that the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, are under persecution. You've heard me say that before in different stories, in different books of the Bible. The Hebrew people are under persecution. The Hebrew people are in a place where the church and 
Christianity and their faith walk and all of that stuff used to look this way and it now looks this way. And there's parts of it that are really, really uncomfortable. There's, there's um, a character that, uh, when I say a character, he was a real person, but there's a person that pops up all through the New Testament, a guy named Paul, we've talked about Paul a bunch, just to show you how uncomfortable it could be for the Hebrew people. Paul is a guy who used to be able to persecute Jesus' followers even to the point of where he would kill them and he would kill them with the authority of the government saying, yeah, go get these guys. Now he is preaching to those people's children. That's the kind of tension that exists for the Hebrew people. The world has changed, and now this person who's talking about everlasting life, now this person who's talking about the way to heaven, is the guy who killed their parents for that message. It's very, very uncomfortable. Also, the people outside of Christianity are making it very uncomfortable for them. In every way, business, personal, family. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And so you can understand that the Hebrew people, they feel up against the wall. They feel like all eyes are on them. Like no matter what they do, they're in trouble. And life is not altogether comfortable for them. And that's just sort of the picture of what it is for the Hebrew people. So I'm going to pick this up in Hebrews chapter 3 and starting in verse 1. Today we're only going to make it to the bottom of verse 6. And this is one of these bits of Scripture that if you read this carefully and you work through this carefully, this has to change your life. This has to change your life. So let me walk through this step by step with you and and, uh, and I'll try to unpack this. So starting in verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God, and are partners with those called to heaven? Think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. Last week we were going through Hebrews chapter 2, and at the bottom of Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, it's made very clear to us that we are in the family of Jesus. Those who believe are considered brothers and sisters. In verse 17, Therefore it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters. He calls us his brothers and sisters. And so now in chapter 3, And so, dear brothers and sisters, they've made the point, we are talking about family. When we talk about the person of Jesus and what Jesus has done and for whom Jesus has done it, he's talking about brothers and sisters. And there's this family dynamic and this family illustration that's really rich. Over the past couple of years here, families have been under tension. A lot of you know what I'm talking about. I am personally part of four funerals that have been put on pause and we're getting to the place where we're thinking maybe there's just not going to be one. And the reason is because of the circumstances around it, pause has had to be pressed because who's allowed to come to the funeral? And there was a time where we weren't allowed to have more than this number of people or you had to be wearing this stuff or you had to be vaccinated or whatever it is. But within the families proper, there's further tension. There's a tension where I can have the funeral, but you can't come because I've made a different decision than you have made regarding vaccination, and I neither want to hurt you nor do I want you to hurt me or anyone else. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, yes, we'll have the funeral, but not only are you not invited, you're uninvited. You can't come. Or there's another funeral that also has not happened, should happen, but on this funeral, the words that have said, that have been said are so hard that it has driven a wedge between the families. Words like people who have or have not done this action should be dragged out and shot. These are the words that have been said. 
And suddenly there is this family dynamic that is so divisive and it's so driven apart that whereas two years ago when I used to talk about brothers and sisters, you get this one image. Now when I talk about families, there's an entirely different image and it's not an easy one. Many of you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't understand it, count yourself blessed. Or maybe your story goes way farther back. Maybe family tension has been there for years, for generations. Maybe there's whole parts of the family that don't talk to other parts of the family, and everybody knows it. And we just kind of don't talk about that anymore. You have a brother and sister who's rogue, they're gone. You have a mother or father who is rogue, they're gone. We had a wonderful couple stay at our house over the storm this past, last week. On the way to her father's funeral, she hasn't seen him in years and years. Drugs, alcohol, bad behavior, abuse, it's a story you know. And now she is going to grieve the guy who will never be able to say, I'm sorry. Family tension. Divorce. Maybe someone married the wrong person. Family tension can come from all over the place. But the author of Hebrews, at the very beginning of chapter 3, and so dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven. And I have this image of Jesus standing there describing us. And he's saying, over here, these are the people who are angry. And over here, these are the people who are broken. They're sick. They're physically sick. Over here, there's the mental sick people. Over here, these are the people who they believe in Jesus. But honestly, I don't know what to do about it because there's so much going on in my life that says, don't trust. And over here, these are the people who are addicted. And over here, these are the people who have hurt someone. And over here, these are the perpetual victims. And over here, these are the people who have got uh, identity issues and sexual identity issues. And over here, we've got people who are at war. And over here, we've got people from Ukraine. And over here, we've got people from Russia. And over here, we've got the people who were part of the Nazi party. And over here, we've got people... And he keeps describing and describing. And when he's done, he says, these guys, they're my brothers and sisters. I love them. I died for them. I died on the cross. I came down. I stopped the God being the the God person who can't be killed. I came down and was flesh and blood. They captured me. They crucified me. Actually, didn't capture him. He came willingly. But we crucified him. And somewhere each of us is going to fall in the description, and the family tension is obvious. And Jesus turning around saying, I died for them. Oh, by the way, I'm preparing a place for them. They have only but to ask to be part of this family. And so the author of this book, of this sermon, and so dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven. Think carefully about this Jesus who we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he was faithful to God who appointed him, just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. Now when you use the name Moses, it's a big name. This is the name of the people who led the Hebrews out of torture, out of horrible death, out of starvation, out of ownership. Maybe let's not play with this name. This is a pretty big name. It's a pretty important name. For he was faithful to God who appointed him just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. If you put yourself in the shoes of the Hebrews people and everything that's going on and all of the pressures on their life and and they're looking at this and they're saying, you know, it would be easier if I just sort of stopped 
being quite as, as diligent a follower. If, if I just turned the volume down just a little bit, I just backed off on the throttle just a little bit, we could still do the ceremonial stuff. We, we could still do, we could still do the, the sort of minimum of, of what's required. I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus is Lord. I can do that. But the rest of the time, we just, we're going to make it a little bit more comfortable on ourselves. And this is a problem. This is something that the Hebrew people are experiencing. And their temptation is to fall back to kind of the soft middle of what Christianity is. In our context, here's how this looks. You, you come to church on Sunday. It, it's sort of a ritual. It's sort of a thing. Easter, we're going to do the Easter thing. Christmas, we're going to do the Christmas thing. We'll be here on Sunday. Probably buy a sandwich from the youth group in a couple of weeks. I hear they're going to be delicious. Well, maybe... Uh, say grace before the meal. We might even pray before our kids go to bed, maybe. But really, that's about it. And what you end up doing is becoming a person who is more concerned about ceremony. Church is going to look the same. You're going to come. We're going to sing some songs. There's going to be an offering plate. Every once in a while, we're going to have communion. We're going to sing probably pretty close to the same number of songs. Pretty close. Someone's going to get up and preach. You don't even really have to listen to that. He'll walk off the stage eventually. Then there's going to be a blessing and out you go and you're good until next week. And it becomes very, very ceremonial. Sort of like looking back all the time to Moses and to what Moses did and saying, yeah, I'm from that Moses tribe. My family came from that thing that Moses did out of Egypt, through the desert. Yeah. It doesn't touch me elsewhere. It it doesn't guide my life. I don't go to God with my questions and listen for His answers and hear His answers and have His answers adjust my behavior. I don't have that. I don't do that. I sort of fall back to the soft center. And and I understand. I understand the the tension there. I understand what it's like to to, uh, have people look at you strangely to have people change the conversation when you're around. One of my, it's a, it's a test, I do it all the time. When I get my hair cut, I'm waiting for someone to say, what do you do for a living? When I answer it, conversation over. Until they tell me, I go to church or I used to go to church. And I say, good, I go to church too. Conversation over happens very often. And it's awkward. One of the things my family is doing, uh, who here watches The Crown, Netflix series The Crown? Oh, man. Every time I talk about TV, it doesn't work. You'd think I'd learn. The Crown is a show we really like it. It's a story about the, the, uh, the, the queen, uh, well, starting with the king and then the queen and, and uh, going sort of decade by decade through. And it's something that uh, we've enjoyed watching it. This is one of the standout things to me. We're re-watching it right now because the next season is supposed to come out shortly. There is so much ceremony around being royal. Like, the ceremony of getting out of bed in the morning. Who wakes you up? How do they wake you up? A different person waking up the, the queen is not going to happen. It's this person. It's always this person. There was a ceremony that happened when one of the royal, uh, the members of the royal family did not like mustaches. And suddenly, ceremony, everyone shaves off their mustaches. When they eat, there is ceremony. There's, a, there's a, one scene, it's kind of funny, where, where uh, the prince is hungry and the food's right there and he wants the food on his plate, but it can't happen because there's ceremony of who serves it and how does it get served. The chairs that they sit on, who sits on those chairs? Not the throne, just a normal chair. That's a chair, but only the queen sits on that chair. And don't you dare if you're not the queen. And there's ceremony in everything. And I watch this and I think to myself, I I don't want to be royal. Like, living in the palace would be kind of neat. The bank account would be interesting. 
everywhere you going, having people sort of celebrating you, whether or not they mean it, they celebrate you. But the ceremony is nonstop. And it's a good illustration, I think, of what Christianity can be if it's not real. Believing in who Jesus is. Even the devil believes in who Jesus is. Coming to church, but never stepping back and considering what Jesus did. We'll move on to the next verse here. Let's go to the next slide. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses. Just as a person who builds the house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder. But the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truth God would later reveal. Sounds pretty good. Here's here's the point. Here's where I need to point us. What did Jesus come to do? When Jesus came down as flesh and blood, and he died on the cross, and he was resurrected again, what did he do? Go ahead, call it out. Starts with saved. He saved us. So the house that he built is not heaven. The house that he built is not earth. The house that he built is the saving of us. That's what he came to do. Anyone who asks, anyone who receives, is part of this family. Suddenly, this image of Jesus twirling around in a circle saying, I love these guys. These are my brothers. These are my sisters. This one over here, they think they have no value. This person over here, they think that other people have no value and they have all of the value. This person over here, they think this. This person over here, they think this. This person over here is scared to death of me and doesn't know what to do, but all of them are my brothers and sisters. And we take a step back from it and we are to consider Consider what God has done. To think carefully about Jesus. Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses. Just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later. But Christ as the Son is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house. And God is in charge, and we are God's house. Do you ever think about that? We are waiting for heaven. But when God talks about the house he built, he's talking about us. We are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. And there's our challenge. The challenge is to consider what God has done for us. To consider carefully. To think about, to ponder, to stop what you're doing and think, well, how does what Jesus did affect what's going on? You see, it's verses like this that end sexism. It's verses like this that end racism. It's verses like this that stop abuse. It's verses like this that stop bad marriages. Rather, enrich bad marriages. Make them good marriages. Because suddenly you're looking at someone not as an opponent, but rather as a brother or a sister even when what they believe is so different than what you believe about so many things. But when we look to Jesus, so long as we say Jesus is Lord, but Jesus is actually Lord, then it changes how we interact with each other. It changes how we interact with Russians today. It it changes how we interact with Nazis in the 40s. It changes how we interact with government officials. It changes how we interact with the church. It changes how we interact with the person at the Walmart cash register or at the fast food place or driving beside you in the car. 
It means that some conversations get had where we look at those who we trust and those who we love and we say, can you please tell me, do you feel loved by me? Am I doing something that hurts you and you don't think you can tell me about it because because I hurt you? This Christmas I was sitting with my sister My sister was talking about some of the conversations that she didn't feel safe in having. She didn't feel, it's not safe, she didn't feel free to have. She felt like if she opened the door, there would be some conversations that were, would be shut down. It was just a cold room. It was a room she wasn't welcoming. The door was locked. The lights were out. Not for you. And we were talking about these different things and there's some different stuff in her life that's going on. And there's this voice in the back of my head. It's God's voice. And he's saying to me, ask her if there are any doors you have closed for her. I really don't want to ask her that. That's the nice thing about a closed door. You don't have to deal with what's behind it. That's what closets are for. Throw things in, slam the doors. Walk away, sell the house, burn it down, whatever. We're not going to deal with what's in that closet. God's voice. Ask her. God... Maybe another time. No, ask her now. God, it's Christmas. We're going to do Christmas things. Ask her. Hey, Becky, is there any doors I've closed? Any conversations that you don't think you can have with me? Long pregnant pause. I hate those. Mm, Had one in a principal's office once. Didn't go well. Had one with a boss, didn't work there much longer. I hate pregnant pauses. How come it couldn't just be a quick, no, everything's great? It wasn't. Long pause. Then she says, I don't feel like I can talk to you about church stuff. Because of what's been going on, because of all the COVID stuff and all the stress and all the everything that's been going on, I feel like if we open that door and we start to talk about it, you're going to be defensive. You're going to push people back. The problem is, I see my sister a couple of times a week. But I see you guys, I don't see her a couple of times a week, I see her a couple of times a year. I see you guys a couple of times a week, some of you. Which means... There are some of you that I've closed doors to. And so I need to ask your forgiveness. I wasn't intentional. I didn't mean to do it. But clearly I had stopped considering Jesus and what he has done. And so there are some topics that were closed. And I ask you to forgive me and knock on those doors. I'm going to do my best to open them. How about you? Are there doors closed? Are there topics closed? Are there people that others would love to ask you about, but they can't because they know how you will react? Are there conversations on the way home that one of you would love to have and the other one doesn't? Why? Consider Jesus. I'm going to invite the band to come back up, the worship team. I'm trying not to call them the band the worship team, to come back to the front? Are there conversations that we can't have? And there's that divisive nature between brothers and sisters. One of the good things that COVID did, although it hurt like crazy, is it put a big magnifying glass on top of those things. A great big one. And the things that we worship came to the surface The things that, as Jesus would spin around, he would say, this person is all about their freedom. This person is all about money. This person is all about whether or not they agree with the law. This person is all about medical stuff. This person is all about those that agree and those that disagree with them. And all these topics came to the surface and we could see them. It was very exposing. At least it was for me. Maybe it was for you. But if we consider Jesus and what Jesus did, more than just believing in him, more than just the ceremony of church, the ceremony of Easter, but consider him. 
Suddenly we look at each other and we say, we need to get rid of these divisive things. There's a term for that. It's called forgiveness. And then when we are done, the proverbial arms of Jesus wrap around us and we have communion together, supper. And we look at each other and say, not a one of us perfect. Just ask Jesus, he'll tell you. But if you choose, you are welcome in the family. This stuff has to change your life. It has to. And if you will consider Jesus, it will. Lord God, this is why you say the meek will inherit the earth. Pride comes before a fall, but humility was modeled by you. Pride is short-sighted. Humility is the understanding of what Jesus came and did and his inclusion and his inclusive nature and his inclusive invitation. Anyone who calls. Lord, when we talk about those who think differently from us and differ from us, God, what we're ultimately saying is we're right and they're wrong. And it's the interesting thing is we can't both be right, but we can both be wrong. And that's humility. Thank you for what you came to do. Thank you for succeeding. Thank you for being perfect. Thank you for loving me with all of my bruises and bumps and warts, all of the sickness, all of the things that I'm wrong about, all of my pride. And yet you look at me and call me brother. Lord, we don't want to be the source of division, we want to be the source of unity. We want people to come and hear the truth of who Jesus is. Help us be that, Lord God, in your very image. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In your name I pray. Amen. There's a blessing I pray over my children every night. If you've come here for a while, you've heard it. I think it's very suiting, suitable for today. I invite you to hold your hands out and receive this like a gift. Receive this like a package given to you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you all the days of your life. Next week, there's something special. You're going to hear from some different people, some of their stories, some of the stuff that God's doing. Some of it they know about, some of it they don't know about, but God knows about. Come next week and hear these stories. We'll see you then.